Welcome to the No Shame Podcast. This is John Groders. Our guest today is Steve Clear, executive producer of a new film based on one of the great classic books in Christian literary history, The Pilgrim's Progress. You might not know this famous allegory yet. Stay tuned on No Shame. Have no shame. Welcome to No Shame. This is John Groders, and our guest today is Steve Cleary. And Steve, this kind of marks about the one-year anniversary for the podcast, and it brings us back to the first guest we ever had on this podcast, which was you. And uh, a year ago, you were announcing Tortured for Christ, and this year, you're announcing The Pilgrim's Progress. So welcome back. Thanks, John. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. I didn't realize I was... uh... It's been the one-year anniversary. I don't even think I realized I was the first one, so I guess I'm honored that you would have me back again. Well, I'm out of friends, and I got to loop around again, and you were the first. <laughs> so you you have said this. I'm very excited about this film. You have said uh, that Pilgrim's Progress has sold more copies than all the Harry Potter books combined, right? Is that true? I said that, but now I don't think it's true. <laughs> I've done a little bit more <laughs> research. Um you know, in that, I think, it, you know, it's really hard to tell, right? Because picture this, you back up a couple decades ago, and this book is being printed secretly in Russia hmm. and distributed to underground Christians. How many are distributed? Now, those are not sold. Then you have the same thing happening in China. Then you have the same thing happening in Eastern Europe. So, you know, nobody really knows right. how many copies have gone forth. So here are the facts. They believe it's been, experts agree, this book, The Pilgrim's Progress, has been translated in over 200 languages. Experts agree it is the second most influential book in history outside the Bible. It's the first, considered the first English novel, and in 340 years, it's never been out of print. That is just, in itself, that is amazing. (laughs) <laughs> that is amazing. And so tell me uh, a little bit about its origins. You know, who wrote it, where, when, why? Well, I'm glad you asked that, because people ask me all the time my affinity with the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. But really, it's with the man who wrote it. So for the past three decades, I've been working among persecuted Christians and visited many countries where Christians are persecuted, and I've studied uh, the martyrs. I've studied those who have suffered for their faith, even if they didn't pay with their life, but were severely persecuted for their faith. And here's this man, John Bunyan, who was a pastor, and he called himself a tinker. Wasn't a well-educated man, and but he loved to preach. And he's preaching, and the government says, whatever, whatever's going on at that time in England, they say, you cannot preach, you don't have permission. And he preaches anyway, so they throw him in prison, and they don't even want him in the prison. They say, John, we'll let you out. You just have to sign a document saying you'll stop preaching. And he says, I can't do that. I can't tell you I'll stop preaching because God has called me to preach. So I believe he served two different terms, but he, he was in prison a total of 12 years. And during that time, he penned many books and wrote a lot of material. And of course, the book he's known for is The Pilgrim's Progress. And I think of this man who was willing to sit in prison because he wanted to preach the gospel, and he probably wasn't thinking he was preaching to a lot of people during that time, right? Hmm. And he, but he writes this book that ministers to hundreds of millions, and I don't think he could have known at that time what God was going to do with this story. So he really, his vision was fulfilled. He became one of the greatest preachers of all time. And that's what I really identify with, is that he wrote this book while being obedient to God, while walking in the straight path, and while wanting to share the message of the Christian journey. Mm. And I think that makes it, for me, that makes it extra special. Yeah, that's amazing. You mentioned Torch for Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, Richard, that book was conceived in prison. Mm -hmm. Look at our New Testament, much of it written in prison. And it's kind of... It's kind of amazing what God has done with men in the midst of their suffering. 
you know, those kind of people like Paul and like Wormbrand and like Bunyan, if they're not in prison, they're busy bringing the kingdom. They're busy doing the work. They're not going to sit in an office all day and be academics because they're out there reaching and loving and, and serving people. And then it's only that <laughs> when God takes that freedom away and throws them in prison, all right, well, then they start to write. Well, I think it throws fire on it. It's yeah. just a different way. Yeah. So you're right, Richard Warmbrand or, you know, maybe John Bunyan wasn't a renowned preacher during that time. Richard Warmbrand does, so you throw him in prison. And the world expects to see kind of a defeated man. And a, a spiritual giant emerges, mm. travels around the world. If he had never been, if he had never lived through that communism, that persecution, we would have never heard that message. Mm. And part of me is humbled and even a little scared of the mm. fact that I am making a movie on the backs of somebody who suffered mm -hmm. and how God has used the suffering of great men and women to benefit the body of Christ. I think even Paul makes mention of it in the Scripture that my suffering is to your benefit. Well, and you're making a cartoon out of it, which is another thing you've had to figure out how to do is tell a story – well, the story itself kind of is an allegory in any way, so I, maybe that wasn't such a leap to make it into a cartoon. We actually felt animation was the perfect mm -hmm. medium to, to uh, represent the Pilgrim's Progress on the big screen. I think for us, with a limited budget, live action would have been, would have been extremely difficult. Mm. You know, we would have had to had $100 million in Peter Jackson, or at least John Groder's on our team. At least. And with animation... We spent five years really crafting the characters in the world and the textures, and it gave us the ability to to capture the fantasy that's contained within, you know, that's within the allegory. So when you think of a character called Giant Despair, who's supposed to be 30 feet tall, that wasn't any more difficult to create <laughs> in an animated world as a normal-sized character. Mm -hmm. But in a live-action world, that would have been a lot more that would have been far more difficult to create. So yeah, CG animation was extremely time consuming. It is very expensive. You know, the average CG animated film coming out of Hollywood is is 80 million. That's the average. Uh, this many from Pixar and Disney that, you know, exceed 100, 120 million dollars. And our budget was a small percentage, you know, a just a tiny bit. Uh, our budget was probably less than their catering budget. And, <laughs> but we, you know, we hired our own animators, we bought our own computers, we licensed our, the software, and we cut out all the middlemen, and we just, we paid them a fair pay to work with us to create this animation of the Pilgrim's Progress. And we're very proud of the team. And we honestly feel that they stretched every dollar to five dollars what it would have cost us if we were to just you know get on google or get on the phone and call the studio mm -hmm. and say here's our script mm -hmm. you know we want to make a hundred minute movie what's it going to cost us i mean we did some of that checking and it was it was five times mm -hmm. more than yeah. what we spent well i've seen the film and it looks fantastic there's there's no sacrifice and here's the thing about an animated film once you once you pull the curtain open and you start the film, you're in that particular world. And almost no two animated films are the same world anyway. I mean, the Charlie Brown movie doesn't look anything like uh, the Hotel Transylvania movie, which doesn't look anything like, you know, Wally, -E, which, you know what I mean? Like, there's not a particular standard. So the Pilgrim's Progress, you were able to do it on a much smaller budget. But once you enter the world, I find myself completely immersed in it. And that, that's where we live. So it's big, it's colorful, it's bright, it's moving well. There's great voices, there's great music. Um, so, I mean, you're right. I'm proud of your team, too. <laughs> oh, thanks, John. That's, you know, I take that as a high compliment. Um, you know, when, when you get complimented by your peers, it can be a lot, it can be a lot different than um, just somebody that doesn't understand, you know, animation and all the attributes of it. And they may just, you know, make a comment through through their own experience. Uh, that's, the quality of the animation has been actually the hardest part on me. People ask me, you know, did you, were you nervous kind of carrying the story, you know, John Bunyan's sacred story 
uh, Andy Irwin called it the holy grail of Christian media, <laughs> you know, mm. and I didn't. Mm. I mean, I really felt that uh, Robert Fernandez, the writer, captured the essence of the book. Other people have agreed. But what has been my burden, what has kept me up at night, is wanting that animation, you know, to be top-notch. And with an animated film typically needing $80 million to, you know, and 400 people for two years to pull off, we didn't have that. And we just had to do the best with what we have. And I remember my friends, you know, at Pure Flix, you know, and these are friends saying, you're insane. You're doing the impossible. How do you do a limited budget CGI animated film? And they tell me no one's tried it before. <laughs> you know, what you're trying to do, no one has dared to go down that path. And like I said, they weren't being critical. They were concerned. And they wanted to make sure that, you know, we were making a good investment with our time and our energy in the last five years. But like you said, you've seen the film and we get comments daily from people that have pre-screened it. We're not out in theaters yet. We will be this Easter weekend shortly. And the comments that are coming back are just a blessing. And I think the message is what shines. Mm -hmm. You know, John Bunyan's story. This isn't our story. This is his story. And he would tell you it's God's story. And we're just caretakers. We're just holding it with honor and putting color to it, putting some characters to it and putting it on the big screen. But, you know, the hardest part for us was the average animated film may have the same characters in a couple worlds. We introduced 15 different mm. worlds, 15 different sets of characters. Mm. And so all of those worlds had to be created, all the backgrounds, all the elements, all the characters, their own, you know, worldly wise men has a completely different demeanor than legality, than the shepherd, than the wizard, and all these different characters. But at the finished product, that's the fun part, to see all these worlds that Christian travels through on his journey. So we're talking to Steve Cleary today on the No Shame podcast. Steve is the executive producer and uh, behind The Pilgrim's Progress, an animated feature film coming out this Easter to theaters all over the country. Uh, is it going to be a three-night engagement? Is that right, Steve? Or what's the, what's the plan? Uh, we're trying to get three dates. We currently have two. Okay. So Thursday evening, 7 o'clock on April 18th is our first showing. We're in 750 theaters. And Saturday afternoon, 12.55 p.m., April 20th is our second showing. We've asked for a third showing because theaters are selling out. We're encouraging people to get your tickets now. And what happens is that it seems to be this film, everybody goes in groups. So a theater may be, you know, half sold out or a third sold out, and all of a sudden the seats are all filling up. In the studios, they have these major Hollywood, you know, soon-to-be blockbusters that I'm competing with. It seems to be just such a jam-packed huh. Easter weekend. Mm -hmm. And we're telling the theaters, hey, I get... I get emails every day, someone saying I can't buy tickets. Hmm. Unless I want to buy the front row hmm. or the handicapped seats, I can't buy tickets. Hmm. And now we have theaters beginning to open up second screens and even third screens because they're filling up. And wow. that's what's exciting to us. And beyond that, you know, we will, we will work with churches. We'll work with individuals that want to see it in their church or in the theater. So after the initial release on Easter weekend, there's going to be lots and lots of opportunities coming this coming this summer. Uh, we really feel that that God has been with us and blessed us on this journey, and we feel this is a special message uh, for the church here and for the church abroad. And this is a tool for evangelism, you know. And this no greater joy than to be on the path, the King's path, and then to lead other people to join mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. That's a biggest, greatest joy hmm. I have in my life. Hmm. I can think of three reasons I think people need to go order these tickets for the April 18th showing or the April 20th, 20th showing. And and part of this is because, Steve, you, you called me three months ago or so to give some input on the trailer. So how to, how to consolidate the Pilgrim's Progress 
as you did into 90 minutes or however long the film is, was a, was a task for you and Robert to pull off. How to consolidate that down into a minute 30 <laughs> is the task of the trailer. So you're taking this epic book, you know, the first English novel, 340 years old, and, uh, and trying to s- s- sort of get to what is going to be the most attractive, which is the job of that trailer, to entice people's interest, right? Um, that's all they get to see of the movie, and they go, I, we need to see that. I want to bring my family to that. But one of the reasons that, at least when I was thinking about that trailer, that uh, would drive me to the theater is, to be honest, I've never actually read Pilgrim's Progress. Now, if you're listening to this podcast and you think I must be the last guy in the world as uh, hasn't read the second most popular book in history, I think you're lying because you probably haven't read it either. <laughs> so isn't it one of those things? We all think we should know it. We've, many of us have heard of it, but it maybe never actually has been on my bedside. And I mean, many people have read it, but I hadn't even as I knew you were making this movie. So one reason to buy the ticket is you really should know, you just should know a few things. You should know Pilgrim's Progress if you're a Christian. And this is kind of an easy way to do it. Yeah, people say, you know, we kid around and they say, you know, I haven't read it, I should read it. And I say, well, you know, now you can wait for the movie. And here it is coming out. (laughs) The exciting part, John, is I believe people will go back and read the book after they see the film. We're also doing a um, home devotional kit. We're doing a Sunday school kit. We're doing a homeschool curriculum. And our desire is also to create a modern version of the book. The book is amazing. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing piece of literature. Like I said, it used to be required reading in you know, Christian schools 20, 30 years ago, and unfortunately it no longer is. It is still required study in seminaries, many seminaries around the country. But we want to we want to create a version of the book that's a little bit easier to read. And also there was some anti Catholic sediment going on at that time between the Protestants and the Catholics. And there was some um, accusations, persecutions that that do not exist today. Mm-hmm. And we feel it would be healthy to remove the anti Catholic sediment from the book. I've been in a process of doing this with Fox's Book of Martyrs, and I've had many, um, many Catholic leaders, you know, thank me for doing that because many Catholics have been persecuted and been martyred, the same as Protestants. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm not advocating um, right and wrong among denominations. I'm just saying that I don't feel, for us, that we have any desire to beat up the Catholic community. Uh, they've been watching the film. They've been wanting to see it in theaters. We've shown private screenings in Catholic schools. And whatever I can do to point people towards Christ, I am all in favor. Mm. Well, that brings me to the second reason I think it's worth seeing this film. You know, if the first was just so that we can be a little more literate in the areas that we wish we were, that's, that's a pretty good reason. But the second reason is that the story of, of Christian in this, in this uh, Bunyan classic is – a journey that he is he's confronted on all sides by the world and by distractions and by side paths and by everything possible that will try to keep him from achieving his purpose in life and even though this was written 340 years ago i mean you tell me doesn't this ring true for the journey that we walk in 2019 i think for us in america it it's a wake up call If I show this film, you know, in a country where Christians are persecuted, they're going to identify with the story that the Christian journey is not, is not always easy, that it comes with trials, tribulations, persecutions. And I think it'll encourage people um, in the persecuted church. But you look at here in America, how many times are we, myself included, guilty of, oh, I'm a Christian, so life is great. You know, I, I make more money because I'm an honest worker. God blesses me financially, and I drive a bigger car. I have a bigger house. And so we start investing in this world. Mm-hmm. But in the Pilgrim's Progress, the allegory, this world is the city of destruction. Mm-hmm. It will perish. There's no eternal rewards on Earth. So as much as we labor to have a successful life on Earth, this, there is no eternal reward, but anything we go into eternity, that one person we witness to, the treasures we store up in heaven, that's eternal. And I think it's a wake-up call for Christians to invest in eternity. 
I always say that every path leads to a destination. And that destination is your, that choice is the most important choice you will ever make in your life, which path Hmm. you walk on. And I'm excited to be able to share that because over the last five years of working on Pilgrim's Progress, it is it, it has ruined my life <laughs> for this world. I am so excited about about inviting others to join the path. I've never considered myself, you know, uh, somebody like Ray Comfort who could just walk up to anybody and say, hey, if you died tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity? It's, I've just never been able to do that. I admire his boldness mm. and his passion for the loss. But now I do tell people, I tell people, hey, what, what path are you on? Hmm. And you know the exciting thing, John, is that you can leave that path by 100 yards. You can leave that path by 100 miles. But it only takes one step to get back on. Hmm. And I encourage people, if you've left that path, Hmm. you can step back on in in one moment. Hmm. You can repent, you can pray, and you can step back on that path. And pray God helps you stay on that path. And then when we're on the path, the most important thing is to invite others. And I believe that's the message of the gospel. I believe that's what John Bunyan was trying to get across in his allegory. And I believe that's why it's as relevant as relevant today as any time in history. And maybe more relevant for any, paci- any passive ways the American church has grown. These are the kind of discussions that will will come out of you seeing the Pilgrim's Progress. These are the kind of uh, thoughts and and redirectives, even with how we spend our time, that come out of a, a classic book like this. You know, one of the characters, I want to bring up a few characters, because if you don't know the story, Pilgrim is going to head off on this journey, and he's going to run into a bunch of characters along the way. It's not totally unlike the Iliad or something in that, in that respect. And I was just last week with you. We were both in Anaheim, and you... You had the giant Pilgrim's Progress bus parked right there on the floor, an amazing sight, a traveling billboard, which apparently today is broken down in Phoenix. Is that right? It is, <laughs> but we have some great service technicians um, and, you know, say a prayer, and they're repairing it, uh, sending us on our way. Uh, we actually want to travel across the entire country and and just share the story with those who will listen and that are interested. Well, if he happens to pass you on any of the highways, please give a wave and a, and a smile to, to Steve and Deb, who are driving the billboard coast to coast, and it is stunning. And I was sitting there recording some of these podcasts, and I mentioned several times, like we talked to Abby Johnson. I said, here we are, Abby, right under the shadow of worldly wise men, because I was back by the rear passenger tire where there's this big purple-hatted character named worldly wise men. Tell me about him and how he fits into this story and even how he fits into what you were just talking about. Worley's been one of our most popular characters, and uh, he actually was designed originally by a leading Pixar artist who was in between. It was in between movies, and he came out of some, some big hits, and it was about ready to do the next Cars movie. And he has a big heart for the Lord, and, and, and he designed that character. So he's very whimsical. And, you know, he convinces Christian not to take the path that leads to hardships. He convinces them to take the path, and he's actually sending them on an easier path. But what Christian doesn't understand is that path leads to more difficulties down the road. And he's sending them to Morality Village, where the way to get rid of your burden, the way to go to heaven, is to obey all the rules. And I think of how often that people have used religion as, here's how you earn your way to heaven, here's the right and wrong. And of course, you know, grace is not a license to sin, but we all know that we cannot make it under, we cannot make it under our own abilities, uh, but for the grace of God. And I think worldly wise men, and he's very flamboyant, and he's obviously rich, and he's saying, no, no, follow the ways of the world, you know, follow wealth, gold, silver, jewels, and just obey all the rules, and everything will be okay. And in the movie, Christian listens to him, as well as in the book, and he veers off the path to a village called Morality. So I think, I think we see that in America. I think we see both legalism, and I think we see worldly wisdom. And I also think we see Vanity Fair, which is another, another world uh, in our movie. And it's amazing that I discovered that even Vanity Fair magazine was derived from the Pilgrim's Progress. John 
Bunyan created that phraseology of Vanity Fair being in a perpetual state of self-indulgence. And I think instead of that being a negative to the world, it's actually a positive. Vanity Fair becomes a big, well-known magazine. Yeah, we want to indulge ourselves in the pleasures of this world, everything that tempts the human soul. And here Bunyan is saying, these are, he tells you the ways to to reach the celestial city, and he also learns the ways that will distract you. And sometimes I think we live in Vanity Fair. Um, you know, there's that our life is filled with living the happiest life we can for every breath we take with no thought of eternity. And you think about it, and that's a, that's a very troublesome state. Mm. Again, 340-year-old book with the kind of uh, common human condition that is sort of timeless, you know. The, the road to the celestial city can be distracted by the easy path, by the worldly path, by perpetual self-indulgence. It's an amazing metaphor that John Bunyan wrote that Steve Cleary and the team at Cat in the Mill have put on the screen. Um, you had some good names in this too. So John Rice Davies, right? He's in the film. John Rice Davies, we're actually uh, trying to figure out if he's in the States right now because we wanted to invite him to the premiere. But I have to tell you, if we have time, John, this is just an amazing story and goes to show about the importance of being a, wis- being a witness. So here, John Rice Davies, I mean, known for Lord of the Rings, known for Raiders of, the, Raiders of the Lost Ark. He can call anybody at any time if he wants to, you know, talk to somebody about, about his faith, about spirituality, about his own journey. And uh, John is a believer, you know, very dedicated believer. He told me at the end of our two-day session, recording session in New Zealand, he said, Steve, he said, I want to tell you, he's a very, very straightforward guy. He said, I want to tell you, he said, when I saw your proposal, I laughed, my proposal to hire him. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he went to set it aside. Now, of course, I'm talking about the budget, mm-hmm. you know, not, not the movie. Right. And what we were able to, to pay him. And he looked at who had put us together who our agent was, which was another uh, man named John that I had met at a film festival. And he said, I saw John's name on there. And I said, if John's involved, I'll do it. And we came to terms and he did it. He did it wholeheartedly. So he's telling me this after we've done all our recordings. Mm. And he said, John's not going to tell you this, but he said he went through a really hard time uh, in his life. And, you know, time where, He's potentially on death's doorstep, and he he never gave up his faith, Mm. and he persevered, and he didn't go around saying, poor me. Mm. He carried spiritual integrity, and he knew where his his destiny, he knew his Savior. And John was, John R. Davis was so inspired by that testimony of this man that probably your listeners have never heard of, just a man I met at a film festival that offered to connect me with, John R. Davis, and he said, it's because of him Mm. I worked on your project, mm. and I will continue working with you mm. because that showed he is a man of God. Wow. So when we think we're, we don't know the ripples right. of our testimony, we don't know that the spiritual integrity we carry walking on the straight path, the good it can do, that the Holy Spirit can do, even in celebrities, people that are very influential around the world. And we also don't know what happens, the dangers, when we lose our witness. And I think we commit spiritual suicide. Mm. I think we're, when we lose our witness, it's the opposite. We're telling people, my faith doesn't hold the answers. It doesn't hold integrity. I want people to be jealous of my, of my joy, of my convictions, of knowing my destiny. And I want people to want to join on that journey, even if the journey is hard. And maybe sometimes as Christians we go, no, no, you accept Jesus and everything will be okay. You know, accept Jesus, you get a better job, you get a better car. Well, no, for the much of the world, you accept Jesus, you get no job, and you might get run out of your village. Right. And so the gospel message, the mystery of the cross, is one that's rejected by the world, but it has this tremendous, tremendous message of bringing us to our Creator for eternity and waiting for him to restore all his creation. Christian has a burden on his back in this film. 
And um, it's part of the story in the book. And how did you handle that? And can you, without giving the movie away, but can you explain, I think it relates to what you were just saying. What is the burden Christians carrying around and how did you portray that? In, in, in the book, Christian has the burden already. So in the movie, we, we wanted to back up a little bit. So we know he finds the book, and we know the more he reads, the more it becomes a burden to him. So he finds the book in the house of Faithful. Faithful has gone, has gone ahead of them. He's already journeyed outside the City of Destruction, past the Forbidden Forest, and he's continued his journey. And he leaves behind this, at his house, this book. And Christian finds the book, and he begins to read. And as he begins to read, the burden begins to grow on his back. And the interesting thing is that while he's in the City of Destruction, he sees and feels the weight of the burden, but none of the other characters can see it. And then when he steps outside, when he begins his first step of his journey through the Forbidden Forest, then every, all the other characters can see his burden. And the more he journeys, the more his burden grows. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And he desires to be freed from his burden. And the interesting thing is, in the movie, when he is freed from his burden, people think that's the end of the movie. I've had people watch it. It's actually exactly the halfway point. And I've had people watch it and go, oh, wow, that's great. That's such an epic scene, a Christian losing his burden. And it's actually just the halfway point of the movie, because his journey as a Christian now begins. Mm. The hardships now begins. The battle with Apollyon now begins. Mm. And I think that's equally important, because when we become a Christian, we have a journey to becoming, to accepting Christ, to being forgiven, and then a new journey begins. And I think it's ironic Mm. that it's exactly the halfway point in the movie. We didn't plan it that way, Hmm. but that's the way it... That's the way it unfolds, and I've had numerous people tell me they thought that was the end of the movie, um, yeah, and it's actually yeah. just the halfway point. If we broke it apart into two parts, that would be the huh. that would be the part. And and he he gets new clothes, and these are nice clothes, and he you know he looks like a happy pilgrim. Well, within five minutes, he gets armor. Okay, you've had your rest. Now the battle begins. Right. And he spends the rest of the movie. In armor, you know, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the shield, the breastplate, and he continues his journey fully armored. Why? Because now he enters into spiritual battle. A spiritual battle he could never win without the help of, of the king, without being saved. But now he can fight the powers. Now he can fight Apollyon because he's been saved. Mm. He is now a child of the king. Mm. Mm. Many of many of our stories, and maybe some of our Christian films, and uh, kind of the thief on the cross. We've had the burden of sin, and we finally are forgiven. The end. But you have uh, done a beautiful job, and 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 this movie is beautiful because we do have the burden of sin. We have been forgiven. The beginning. Uh, now off we go to bring the kingdom. And and you're right. When he puts on his armor, now it's it's game on. And all right, my four-year-old and two-year-old uh, grandkids, they love the movie. I wasn't sure they could be watching some of those Apollyon battles, but for some reason we've had it running in our house, and they, they're digging it. So what, who, how old, uh, how young, what do you say? <laughs> well, it's been a joy to learn about your grandkids, so I love that they're fans, <laughs> and I actually heard they walk around saying they're going to be Christian and beat up the devil, uh, <laughs> which is just so cool. Uh, but we do have to say that we are officially PG-rated, and our recommendation is A+. So I've had tons of four-year-olds watch the film, five-year-olds, six-year-olds watch it, love it, but we we leave that up to the parents. And I think parents know best, and I think parents should just use wisdom. If you have somebody, if you have a child under eight, you know what they've watched, you know what they can handle. You know, I don't want to sound, you know, uh, politically incorrect in any way, but sometimes boys have a little bit easier time, younger boys dealing with the subject matter of a battle scene than girls do. But my granddaughter is four years old. She is not ready to watch the film. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Her younger sister is probably more ready. (laughs) But, you know, Mm -hmm. my granddaughter is extremely sensitive Mm -hmm. when she sees different scenes with me, you know, Mm -hmm. if it's a little bit scary. And she gets scared on Disney films and she'll, she'll hug me. Now she wants to see it. She wants mm-hmm. to see it desperately. 
she goes around telling her friends, my grandpa made a, made a moving. She calls it a moving. A moving, that's good. She's and, right. You know, she tells everybody, and she's become a big advocate for the movie. But I would, I would use caution. I might block her eyes. Yeah. Uh, of course, I know where the scary right. scenes come out in the movie, but but parents can use discretion. Um, there's different ways if they want their pastor to screen it ahead of time before they promote it to certain age groups and churches. Uh, we work with churches all the time. We've worked with over a thousand of them that have determined if this is appropriate for a younger audience. And a couple of them, you know, a percentage of them has said it's for our younger kids. We, we really don't want to promote it to them. I think sometimes when you think animation, you automatically think little kids. But we made a family animation. We, need, we made an animation that carries the drama of, you know, the Pilgrim's Progress. It's not a VeggieTales version. It's not a Lego movie version. It carries the grit of the story that John Bunyan wrote in prison, and mm. we felt like we had to honor that. Mm. Well, to me, this even this conversation, if you're listening to the No Shame podcast, we're talking with Steve Cleary, the executive producer of The Pilgrim's Progress, a uh, feature-length animated film coming out this Easter, April 18th and April 20th. Uh, go see it. Uh, order tickets early. One of the first discussions that I had with some of my colleagues here was, man, this is a complicated thing because you're taking a grown-up's book, The Pilgrim's Progress is a grown-up book, putting it like what you said is often considered to be a children's medium, and you know it would have been possible for you to miss both, for it to be too scary for the kids and too kiddy for the grown-ups. I mean, but I don't think that happened. And one of the reasons I don't think that happened is this very conversation that we've just been having here. If you, as a, I don't care if you're a double PhD theology, uh, th- theologian, you know, you can take in the medium with which you've told the story and have uh, a chance to chew on this journey and these 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 allegories and you can take them in a thousand different depths or if you're eight years old you can sit there and watch and say that was great you know she she loved it it's got that kind of complexity to it you know it does and i think we had to wrestle with that uh and i think they were sometimes uh people consulting with us that said no you have to do more of this and you know john's allegory of um you know because christian walks away from his family which is the mm-hmm. allegory is a spiritual journey. We're not advocating, mm-hmm. you know, parents leave their families. Um, they need to be a witness and provide for their families. Even John Bunyan was burdened heavily while in prison that he wasn't with his wife and children. Mm. So there is that element that that's the seriousness of it and that people have talked to us about. And it's also that, you know, we didn't make it for little kids. We had a leading Christian outlet that said we want it to be more fun. I think people say we want it to be more funny. And it just wasn't, it wasn't a story I felt called to make. Would it be wrong for somebody to make that? You know, probably not. I mean, and it may be fun to watch. I, I want my grandkids to watch VeggieTales. I want them to sing the songs. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. we will buy the videos for them. Mm-hmm. But with all due respect, I don't want that to be their spiritual truth. Mm-hmm. I want that to be wholesome entertainment in the song's whole truth. But, you know, it is fun and it is funny. But we felt that we were taking a serious subject matter. Again, your path leads to a destination. My own son is 26 years old and grew up in Sunday school, and my biggest critic, you know, (laughs) is looking at the movie and saying, does Christian represent me? Hmm. Does he represent everybody that says they believe in God? Hmm. And I said, absolutely. That is the allegory. It is your story. and It's your journey. And we've been able to talk about... We've been able to talk about faith and scripture and salvation on a different level. And he believes in God, but he struggles with religion. He, you know, goes to church about once a month and he struggles with all the pat answers. And he's a typical millennial. And millennials are not seeing as reading the Bible more. They're not seeing as going to Sunday school more. Uh, young children are not going to Sunday school more. So we're, we're saying, where, where's the meat? And mm. I was burdened to read a Southern Baptist um, convention. They did this big report on answering the question, why is Sunday school, children's Sunday school declining, attendance declining? And you boil it down to they're bored and they're busy. Mm. So they'd rather be doing something else. And, I, you know, I wondered, have we done ourselves any favors by t- 
tickling their ears if that's with what we've done. Mm. Have we tried to make Sunday school so fun that we've lost the meat of the message? Mm. I don't know. That's, mm. that, that's up to people smarter than me, mm. you know, to answer that question. But I know if I'm going to dedicate five years of my time and my life savings and the life savings of our executive team, I want a message that really does talk about the truth of the gospel and talk about the truth of our journey and the fact that, like you said earlier, there is a devil that does not want us to reach the celestial city, and he will do everything he can to prevent that. And unfortunately, he often succeeds. Yeah. Those those uh, those antagonists are frequent through through the movie, but they are accompanied sometimes with helpers. And and on the Christian path, you know, John Bunyan's allegory: we're not all alone, and he doesn't send us out in the world, you know, with with nobody to help us. One of the helpers in the film is the marvelous uh, Kristen Getty. Can you tell me about her? We signed uh, Kristen. After we had already had another voice and we had animated the interpreter, as the film started getting to be bigger and bigger, and after we signed uh, John Rice Davis and we decided we wanted a couple more uh, known celebrities, we approach Kristen Getty. Now, if you don't know who Kristen Getty is, you probably know, you know, the hymn in Christ Alone. It's maybe the number one hymn uh, in the world of our generation, and just an incredible worship song. And she's the one that has brought that forth. And she's such a wonderful, wonderful person. And she accepted gladly the role of voicing the interpreter, in which represents, in our allegory, represents the Holy Spirit. Now, in the book, for those who know the book, the interpreter was a male character. And we felt we wanted to add, you know, at least one uh, hero in the movie to be, to, to be a woman. So we chose the interpreter and chose Kristen Getty, and she recorded it for us, did an amazing job, and now she's going to open the film in the theaters. So mm-hmm. nobody knows this, John, you've, mm-hmm. un, you've mm-hmm. unlatched Scoop. the secret, this, <laughs> and the secret is, when you go to the movies, arrive on time, because right before the movie starts, Kristen Getty's going to share a special message, and that message has just blessed me to no end, and it's it's a message I've never really considered before. And she talks about imagination. She talks about, you know, faith and, and our journey and does an amazing job. And I've watched it over and over and over through, through the production of it. And I think it's just a wonderful compliment. It's a wonderful uh, pre-production uh, to the show. And so Kristen is playing multiple roles. And, mm-hmm. and we have grown close to Keith and Kristen Getty, and they're talking about helping us do other things mm. overseas and blessing pastors around the world. And they are just an amazing, amazing couple, mm. uh, just completely sold out for the kingdom and talented beyond imagination. Mm. Now, John, you already know this because you use Keith and Kristen, you know, in the film Tortured of a Christ that we did together. And that was amazing in that film. So it was a, it was a real blessing to, to include them again and God willing, if I produce another film, Kristen Getty is on the yeah. very short list. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to include in the production. Well, it was, she's so in, uh, appropriate for the role of interpreter because, and it really on our path, I mean, some of these great songwriters of our generation, they are assisting us on the walk. Songs like In Christ Alone can be anthems for our journey. And Keith and Kristen are, like you said, right on the short list of those people who have been helpful to us, even if you never met them. We've had the privilege of meeting them, and they're great, but you don't have to have met them for them to be an assistance because, of, because through their music, uh, they have been assisting us on our, on our walk. So it was a great choice. I, I love that you got John Reese davies I love that you got Kristen Getty. And then lastly, you got a guy named Ben Price. I think he, does, Price. he does everyone else, right? Yeah, he could. Uh, ben Price is a uh, voice impersonator. From Australia, he was on Australia's Got Talent. Uh, amazing, amazing heart for God. Uh, Ray Comfort introduced me to him. He didn't introduce me to him, so if you know Ray Comfort, he said you have to contact this guy because you're just going to love working with him, wow. and he's going to do a great job. And I'm in the middle of handling a hundred things, and you know Ray reaches out to me again. He's like, "Have you contacted Ben?" And then he sees Ben, and Ben writes to me, and he says, 
he says, he says, hello, mate. He says, what do you got working on? Love to help. And mm. he came over. He could have, he's like, he's like, which voices do you want me to do? So Ben does 200 voices. He has this natural gift that if he hears a voice once, he can repeat it and, uh, and repeat that voice kind of like a modern day rich little and he's got 200 voices in his brain. I, I, I don't know how, you know, talk about split personality. <laughs> mm-hmm. I kind of asked him how he categorizes all that. Mm. And his primary role was Judge Haygood. Now, the interesting thing about Judge Haygood is he's the judge, you know, of the town of Vanity Fair. And he's the one that judges uh, Christian and Faithful. And I won't, I won't give away uh, what his judgment is, but they have a full jury, and the jury has to decide. If, if Christian and faithful are guilty, and if they're guilty, what are they guilty of? And this Vanity Fair is on the very path of the celestial city, so it's not like you can go around it. Mm. And it's interesting in the allegory because it says you have to you have to go through. And the story says that many many have succumbed to the temptations. And the characters we have lots and lots of characters in Vanity Fair. And they kind of have a plastic look about them. They don't have the same textures and the same flow of hair. They're kind of stiff and plasticky. And we did this intentionally because in a spiritual sense, this is what happens when you're just absorbed by the pleasures of the world. You lose your spiritual identity. You, you lose that, you know, what God has put in you to seek out your Savior and your Creator. And you just become, even what I've heard some people say, are plastic Christians. You know, they no longer have, they no longer have that passion inside of them. They no longer have that call. They, they're they spiritually dead on the inside. And so they've kind of become plastic on the outside. And we played up on that in Vanity Fair. And hmm. so I won't give hmm. away, hmm. won't do a spoiler. Huh. If you know the book, you know what happens. But Judge Haygood has to decide what to do with these two men, find them hmm. guilty or innocent. And what are they guilty and innocent of? Mm. And what could they possibly do wrong in a fair? Mm. And, 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 and they disrupt the fair with their message. Um, the Vanity Fair is, my, is personally my favorite scene. And as we've screened the film, we have found that it is either somebody's favorite or least favorite. Mm. And some people have said, all the characters look plastic. Mm-hmm. And we're like, yeah, think about it. Think about why we did that. Mm. And then when they start discussing it, then they go, I get it. Then they, then they want to see it again. But wow. Vanity Fair is towards the end of the movie. Uh, ben Price plays three or four characters in that scene. Mm. And he didn't even recognize his own voice. It's just, <laughs> the diversity of his range is unbelievable. <laughs> he did a great job. Yeah. Um, you know, pray for Ben. He's been approached by America's Got Talent and different shows, reality shows in America. And he's told me, he goes, Steve, he goes, I'm willing to do it if that's what God wants me to do. But if this is going to propel me into success that doesn't include the gospel, then I don't want to do it. Mm. It's not about the money. Mm. It's about the souls I can reach. And mm. so if this is a platform for me to be a witness, I want to do it. If it's not, I don't want to do it. I mean, you talk about integrity. Mm. You talk about walking the straight path. Can you can you imagine even considering giving up being on a show like America's like uh, mm. America's Got Talent mm. when your whole livelihood comes from performing? Mm. So I really admire Ben. Uh, I do hope people get to know him here in the states. He's been on the Huckabee Show. He's been on some different shows. He he really does a great job. But you don't really understand his heart until you meet him and talk to him. And it just it just is an incredible witness to me. Mm. Um, that he would give up fame and fortune if it meant he could not be a witness to exactly the way God wanted them to be a witness. I think John Bunyan would be proud. I think he had in mind Christians taking stances like Ben is taking, Christians taking the walk like John and Kristen Getty. And I think when he would, <laughs> he might not have envisioned it in his mind the way the artists envisioned it, but I think the spirit has been captured. I certainly believe that his heart to uh, propel people towards the celestial city, towards the best that God has for them, and giving them tools and allegories to resist the temptations which so easily tempt and snare, as the Bible says, was a big goal of his. That's a big goal of the movie. It's, it's just marvelous to discuss it with you. Makes me excited to see it again on the big screen because I've seen it, you know, 
on smaller screens. So it'll be wonderful to see it. Um, again, it's the 18th of April, which is the Thursday, 7 o'clock at night, or Saturday at 12.55, 750 theaters around the country. See the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, support Steve Cleary and Robert Fernandez and all these great people who have put five years of their lives into making this film and to bringing it to the screen for us. Um, we appreciate your work, and we just pray a blessing on the release. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you for this time. And we appreciate your studio. I mean, you guys have always been a great help to us. Your listeners probably don't know, but you're the ones behind the scenes, even helping us on this film to get DCPs to theaters and to get files and to do stuff online. So we appreciate your production company. Uh, we appreciate your team. Honestly, like, we couldn't do this without people that are willing to go the extra mile because I think everybody has. Everybody's gone the extra mile. I think some of our team would say mile. I mean, like three miles. <laughs> well, that's um, what the Bible says. If they say go a mile, you're supposed to go two, right? That's right. Yeah, so I add them together, you know, and our journey requires <laughs> three, three miles, miles. Three miles. Where's the but website? You know, the uh, website is pilgrims.movie. So don't get confused. There's no .com. It's just pilgrims.movie. Take you to the website. Type in your zip code. You'll see the theater listings. Hopefully there's a theater in your area. If it's not and you're interested in hosting, we can help you with that. There's places to click through and contact us. We'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear from you before and after the theatrical showing. This is a tool for the church. You know, and John, you and I didn't even talk about the big missions play with this. Maybe another segment. But our goal is to encourage you and be a tool yeah. for you to encourage others. Straight path. Straight path. That's what it's about. Super cool, Steve. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress coming in theaters soon. And this has been uh, the No Shame Podcast with John Groders. And thanks again, Steve. We are so excited for your bus tour. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Have no shame.